Well, thank you for being here. As Miko White said, my name is Federico Fernandez. I'm with the Austrian Economic Center in, in, in Vienna in Austria and with Fundación Bases in, in Argentina, which was very close to become Venezuela, so uh, as the rest of South America, and we'll, we'll speak about that as well. Be before I start, you know, I, I usually try to make jokes during my talks, but this one is quite complicated, so I'll, I'll do my best, you know, not to depress you a lot, at least. Um, in any case, uh, before, I, bef in, before I start with my remarks, I want to thank everybody with, who is involved with the organization of this event. It's great that we are all gathered here at Mises, you know, birthday, and really thank you very much to Migo Y and to, to the Institute Misesa of Poland for inviting me. It's a great honor. I'm very happy to be with you all today. So, um, before we start, I mean, in 1999, Hugo Chavez arrived to power in Venezuela. He would remain there until 2013. It's not that his, you know, term expired. His life expired. He died. I mean, he stayed in power until, until he died. He was, well, well, we'll talk about his replacement later. In any case, when he arrived, you know, he was celebrated and greeted by the international left, by a great part of the media, by people like Joseph, like Joseph Stiglitz, as you know, a man of the people, somebody who will finally came and will do something for the poor. And not only that, his arrival in 1999 triggered a, an almost a, a small revolution in the whole of South America and, and, and Latin America, because Chavez will not be alone for, uh, for long. Neoliberalism, so, so to speak, of the 90s was, you know, exhausted, and there was like a change in, in command. Chavez started in 1999, and soon later we had the Kirchners in Argentina. They ruled, you know, between 2003 and 2015. The Kirchners, I, I refer to them as the Kirchners because it was two of them, unfortunately. Um, one, one had one period, and then uh, his wife, Cristina, had two other periods. Um, the Kirchners come from the political movement started by Juan Domingo Perón, cleverly named Peronism. Um, Perón was, is deemed by many, myself included, by, as the, you know, the, the person who started the decay in Argentina, which la now lasts 70 years, more or less, uh, since 1946. From Perón, Chávez, and then Maduro, we learn a lot. Uh, particularly, you know, the populist know-how. Um, it's not the best role model, but definitely was a role model for, for Chávez. Then, well, you know, there's this romantic scene. Um, Lula and Dilma Rousseff in Brazil. They were between 2003 and 2016. Lula, if Mises is the last night of liberalism, which definitely he is, Lula is the last night of populism. He's in jail now, but, well, you know, these things happen. As <laughs> indeed. Um, and Dilma was impeached. But in a way, he was, Lula was also a great hero uh, of, you know, of many. He was this union man who converted himself and finally won the election and supposedly was going to do lots of things for the people of Brazil. The economy of Brazil now is in shambles. Uh, uh, well, this, he's in jail at least. Evo Morales in Bolivia, he's um, creative in a way. He arrived to power in 2006. By the way, there was a referendum when people voted. This happened last year. People voted that they don't want Morales to ever run again. But he went to the Supreme Court of Bolivia, and the Supreme Court found out that this referendum violated Evo Morales' uh, human rights. I'm not kidding. Therefore, he will be able to run again. He and his vice president, a gentleman named Garcia Linera, they came up with a very interesting combination of Marxism and indigenism. It's very funny in a way because Marx had a very low idea, you know, an opinion of the Native American peoples. He, you know, probably because of the, of the influence of Hegel, he considered them to be out of universal history. So probably he wouldn't approve what... Um, Morales is doing, but he's doing it anyway, and, and, and he was a Chavista, you know, like he played the, the, the he, he took the playbook of, of Chavez to the perfection, you know, with nationalizations, public, exploding public spending, and persecution of the opposition. 
Rafael Correa, again, he, 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 he left last year, uh, we miss him dearly. Um, he was replaced by Lenin Moreno, not the best name, but he's better. It's unbelievable that the guy who's named Lenin is better than you. I mean, that would make you, you know, uh, rethink your whole life. <laughs> he's, he's not, you know, it's difficult to say that this is the best of the bunch because this is a, you know, very particular bunch, but at least he's like, I mean, he's the less worse. I don't know how to say it in English. Ecuador had dollarized its economy before Korea, and he didn't touch that. And that was a good thing, definitely, because at least put certain constraints of, of the level of damage he could do. It's very funny. He was asked when he arrived to power, you're going to revert dollarization. And he replied, do you want a civil war in Ecuador? So there were some, you know, some synapses in his brain. That's very good. And, you know, how can we forget in Latin America this, this pair? Um, the Castros, they have been enslaving Cuba for, the, for more than five decades now. There's, I mean, technically, well, Fidel Castro apparently passed away, or one of his latest doubles passed away. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Raul Castro formally has stepped down, but, you know, he's replaced by a sock puppet. They are still in charge. Um, and, well, if from Perón, Chavez got the populist know-how from this gentleman, Chavez got the totalitarian know-how. And this is not a joke because currently uh, the, the repression in, in Venezuela is now, as we speak, carried out with the help, you know, and even the, the physical, actual help of, of Cuban agents in, the, in, in, in Venezuela. And well, last but definitely not least, uh, Maduro and, and Hugo Chavez. As I, like I told you, the, the guy in the picture is uh, Hugo Chavez. He passed away in 2013. He was replaced by his chauffeur and professional bus driver, Nicolás Maduro. He's driving the, the destinies of the country now. <laughs> we, uh, and these two, you know, in a way, are the, the responsibles for the, um, for the application of the socialist program in Venezuela. Ma uh, Chavez, when he got to power, called his own revolution 21st century socialism. We will see, I mean, sorry for the spoiler, it was very much like 20th century socialism. Uh, but well, it was at least a refurbish in some certain way. But before we go to more deeply to analyze what, what they were trying to do and how they did it, I would like to tell you just briefly what kind of country Venezuela was prior to the arrival of this, uh, of this Duo. Venezuela definitely was not, I mean, in, in, I come from there, I, I, am, from, I am Argentinian. Uh, Latin America is a difficult place, you know, in the world with many good things, but unfortunately in the political and institutional spectrum is, is complicated. But Venezuela was not one of the worst. In fact, was one of the best. It wasn't Switzerland, but it was not what it is today, definitely. So, Venezuela was the most stable democracy in Latin America. You know, this means that you know, the constitution was more or less applied. The politicians you know, had a term, they finished and they went home. Elections were fair and, you know, and, and transparent. Normal things. It was also a safe haven. Venezuela, particularly in the 70s, in the whole of Latin America, there were lots of problems. There were guerrillas, there were political violence, there, was a military, there were military dictatorships, and many people fled to Venezuela because it was a very stable country, and they were greeted with open arms in Venezuela, which is really a shame because all the pictures that I saw, I showed you earlier, Evo Morales, Cristina Kirchner, and all of those guys are accomplices of what is going on in Venezuela. Their, their behavior is really a shame for the, I mean, of course, politicians do not represent the people, but it's a shame for our history how we have delivered, you know, the Venezuelan people in the hands of these criminals. Venezuela was also a relatively rich country. The standards of living were better than the average of uh, Latin America. Um, the, the income was much better than the, than the average of Latin America. Venezuela used to have a very stable currency. And this is why Venezuela was known as the key to Latin America. Even in the, in the early 80s, the many multinational companies have the, had their, their, 
their bases, you know, for the whole of the region in Caracas, because it, it was the most important country. And I did, my girlfriend is here, I shouldn't show you this, uh, this next slide, but I did a lot of research, Venezuela also, is, <laughs> I, de I devoted most of my time researching about this, is the country with, most, uh, with the most Miss Universes uh, in the world, and also, you know, like the per capita highest of winners of, of, of beauty contests. Unfortunately, there are not only the beauty, but also the beasts. And the beasts were very, very lucky. Venezuela, as we, as we know, literally floats on oil. It has the biggest proven reserves of oil in the world, more than Saudi Arabia, more than you know, the Emirates. And this is what happened with the price, uh, the price of oil since Chavez arrived to power. This is, well, 1999 is more or less here. When he got into power, oil, the barrel of oil was less than $10 per barrel. As we see, let's put, you know, when Chavez arrival to power as the ER0, they like that, you know, kind of megalomaniac uh, chronology. And since the ER0 of the revolution, the price has done nothing but to go up. But not only that, in 2008, it reached almost $140. 2008, we all know the crisis. The price collapsed, but just for a very short time. And then it recovered again. And we have this segment, which is four years of the price in the vicinity of $120 all the time. Now, with the so-called low prices, oil is around uh, $75 per barrel. Of course, there have been some inflation, I mean, but this is really very good. I always like to put it this way. Let's suppose, because you know, the, the, one of the official um, things that are said about Venezuela is that it's, it's uh, the price of oil uh, that has collapsed. Um, that is, you know, the cause of all the evils of Venezuela. I mean, no oil country is in the state of Venezuela now, but anyway. Let's suppose the following. Let's suppose I ask my very good, I, I tell my very good friend um, Richard that in 19 years, his current income will be seven and a half times what it is today. But not only that, measured in a hard currency, not only that, at one point it will be 14 times what it is, what it is today. For 40, it, it will never go down, you know, from what it is today. And from four years in a, row, in a row, it will be 12 times what it is today. I don't think Richard's reply will be, oh, then I will be in a terminal crisis in 19 years. Really, I don't think anyone's reply would be that. This has been the best commodity price context in history. Not only you know, for Venezuela, but for Argentina, everything that we exported also went to the roof for Bolivia. That's why Evo Morales could do a lot of uh, bad policies uh, with natural, you know, selling natural gas. We can, discuss, we can discuss why this happened. You know, this in a way was an unintended consequence of the Fed policy, but in any case, this, this was magnificent. Oil prices are not to blame for the current state of Venezuela. And not only that, uh, these oil prices, this what you see here, had allowed for you know, a magnificent party, so to speak. And we all know that. There's no party like the Socialist Party. And which party I mean, it's the party of socialist redistribution. And if you allow me, and I know it's a, it's a, very, it's a little bit strong, Socialist redistribution is like drug addiction. And when I say drug addiction, I'm not thinking you know, of regularly smoking certain dubious substance you know, or some soft thing. Thinking of heroin addiction. The first stage is the problem of heroin addiction. I mean, I've never tried any drugs. I'm very boring. But in any case, uh, the problem with um, heroin addiction is probably the first stages of the habit must be great. I mean, people must feel you know, like the best time in their lives. Give it enough time of consumption and use of heroin, and you will find yourself at the brink of death. Maybe they have to chop off your arm. And the situation is more or less, I don't know if you see this movie, Requiem for a Dream. It's more or less like that. And that is what, that is what a redistribution did to, did to Venezuela. And this is, this is very important because the lasting effects of this are um, you, you can see them, and that is why 
Chavez still has certain, well, Chavez and Maduro still have certain support, and that, that's why Peronism had certain support in Argentina for, for so many years. At the first stages of socialist redistribution, things get a little bit better. Uh, for some people, things improve. And that is how the myth is created. There is somebody, finally, there's somebody who came and, do, and, and is doing something for the people. There's, you know, like this sort of popular government, you know, that it's uh, caring about the poor, especially. Of course, this is not sustainable, like, you know, heroin addiction is not sustainable. And when the first cracks and failures start, start happening, you know, you should revert what you are doing. But the, the you know, the manual, uh, the, the, the response by all these people is the textbook response is there's some sort of um, conspiracy. It could be, you know, the oligarchs of the country, the U.S., of course, in Latin America, everybody, everything is the fault of the U.S. You know, Institute Mises from Poland, anybody could be the, the, you name it, it doesn't matter who, but there's always some dark forces who are the ones to blame um, for the problems that, you know, the popular, the so-called popular government is facing. Of course, this conspiracy narrative is totally false. I always like to, to, to remember what the term that Mises closely linked to socialism. And that term was destructionism, from destruction. I mean, and it's, I, I think he coined the term, I'm not sure. Um, in any case, socialism, according to Mises, does not create nothing, does not create anything, does not produce anything. It can only live out of the stocks and the capital that were produced by previous generations in a more free market environment. And that is exactly what every populist does and what all the socialists of the 21st century did. And not only that, they were, it was destructionism with good fortune, let's say, because they not only had the capital accumulated by previous generations, which in the case of Venezuela was not, you know, very, no, was not small, but they also had the best commodity prices in history. We have to bear in mind that in Venezuela, the oil industry is basically nationalized totally. PDVSA, which is the state-owned company, runs the oil business of the country that has the most oil in the world. The situation basically was what happened in Venezuela and what happened in all our countries uh, in Latin America under the 21st century socialism was that we lived as if there were no tomorrow. It's like we grabbed all our things, we sold them, we emptied our bank accounts, stopped paying our debts, and you know, start partying and having a great time for some time. And depending how much you and your family accumulated, life will be great. Then you will be found, you know, on the brink of collapse and absolutely broke. And that is what uh, happened in, in Venezuela, and that is what Chavez did to the, to the economy. I just want to see how much time I have. I have more, don't worry, I have more. Uh, so, let's talk about what Chavez, it's a pity, I can send you the, the, the link of this video, it has English subtitles. This is, let's see the Chavismo in action, socialism, socialism of, 20, uh, of 21st century in action. And then we'll talk briefly about the consequences of all this and all the achievements it, 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 it got. This is a short video, it's one minute, unfortunately I cannot show you now because of a um, technical problem, of Chavez nationalizing property on national TV with the power of his finger. He's walking in a, in, in, the, in a main square in Caracas in the center and somebody tells him, there live Bolivar, who is one of the liberators of South America. And he said, oh, they are, national, let's nationalize it. And he starts nationalizing. Uh, he nationalized things like that. So, one of the first things we have to um, comment about the economic policies of, of Chavismo is that Chavez and then Maduro, but Chavez is the one who started all, launched a full-blown assault of, of private property. It is estimated that numbers are very difficult to get, you know, about Venezuela. Now the, the statistics are completely faked or, or inexistent. But it is estimated that more than 60,000 properties of different kinds have been nationalized by the government. Most of them without any kind of compensation. I'm not even saying fair compensation, without any kind of compensation. The rationale about, you know, behind this was that 
Of course, private property is linked to capitalist exploitation. After 60,000 properties being nationalized, I would say that capitalist exploitation in, the, in Venezuela has disappeared, or at least is you know, severely limited. Because let's bear this in mind, because then we'll see how does a world look, a country looked without private property capitalist exploitation. By the hand of this came the destruction of the, of the business environment. Chavez basically launched an assault on you know, the most fundamental institution of a market, which is private property. And this instability and completely lack, lack, of, uh, lack of rule of law destroyed the business environment. When you have this situation, you have capital flight and basically zero foreign direct investment, which for every country, but especially for countries in Latin America, they are very important. And when you don't have investment, you don't have, um, you don't have jobs. Private employment plummeted since Chavez started doing all these things. Needless to say, in every score, in, sorry, in every ranking such as doing business by the World Bank, um, the competitive in index by the World Economic Forum, uh, the, the, the International Property Right Index by the Property Right Alliance and the Economic, uh, Liberty, Economic Liberty Index by Heritage, the scores of Venezuela are appalling. So in that sense, I mean, that's, they, they clearly um, achieved what they wanted. We'll see the, the results later. Oil. Apparently, this is difficult to know now. I would say it's 100%, but I cannot, uh, I cannot um, prove it. But it is estimated that approximately 80% of the state revenue comes from oil, and 91% of, the, um, of, the, of Venezuelan exports are oil. That this is from 2017. Um, Venezuela has always been linked, of course, to the oil cycle, but uh, the actions by Chavez and Maduro had totally exacerbated this situation, and Venezuela has transformed itself into an absolute petrostate. Not only that, the, econo the Venezuelan economist who is based in Harvard, uh, Ricardo Hausmann, by the way, he writes, uh, when he writes about Venezuela, he's somebody to, to follow. Um, he claims that in 2012, which is the last year that Chavez, the last full year of Chavez in, in command, Venezuela, the state of Venezuela spent as if the, the oil, um, the barrel of oil w uh, were $197. It didn't, it never reached that price. And of course, Chavez achieved this miracle by using the windfall of oil as collateral for debt. Because that's the other thing that's the other thing that, uh, that they did. Um, Venezuela is hugely indebted. It's very funny, people who have, you know, Austrian inclinations or, or classical liberal inclinations. In Latin America, by the left, we are always accused of being agents, you know, of foreign capital, you know, or, or servants of foreign interests. Just let me tell you one thing. Last year, PDVSA, the state-owned uh, oil company, signed a, a deal, so for lack of a better word, with Goldman Sachs, a socialist institution, clearly, as we all know, in exchange of $865 million, PDVSA committed to pay up to uh, 2022 $3.65 billion. It's four times what, um, what Goldman Sachs got them and the, the, the agents of foreign uh, imperialism and capitalism, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's us. Venezuela, the state of Venezuela uh, defaulted last November anyway, <laughs> and the, the, the debt is, uh, is in a limbo now, and really I don't, I don't think they are going to restructure it for a very long time. In any case, I wanted to mention this because it tells you how cruel this government can be, Last year, and well, since 2012, last year was the worst one, they started applying a policy that they copied from Nicolae Ceausescu of Romania in the 80s, which is basically to cut all the, all the imports, 
in order to keep as much hard currency as they could to serve the debt. And they did that, and between 2012 and 2016, the imports per capita in real terms in Venezuela dropped by 75%. And that year, 2017, it was even worse than that. This means basically that Venezuelans didn't have, you know, medicine, computers, you know, we are not talking that they were not buying BMWs or, you know, airplane jet fighters, no, no. That's, a, that's one of the things um, this government did to, to, its, uh, to, to its population. And, of course, since 2003, Chavez started to apply capital controls. The system, it's, it's very difficult. I, I, sometimes it's difficult for me to understand it and explain it in Spanish. In English, it's even more difficult. The system is completely insane. Uh, since Chavez started this uh, financial repression, the, the, the currency changed. I mean, the, this was with the Bolivar, then we had the Bolivar Fuerte or Strong Bolivar, and since last August, I'll be talking about that later, we have the Sovereign Bolivar, the Bolivar Soberano. I mean, the first one, uh, the, the Bolivar Fuerte was not very strong, so we'll, we'll see what happens with Venezuelan sovereignty uh, if the trend continues. Um, in any case, uh, according to the exchange rate that you can access, Venezuela can be extremely cheap in dollars or extremely expensive. But the key issue is that who gets the cheap dollars, of course, the politically connected. So it was a huge boost for state power and corruption. Well, the, you know, nationalizing 60,000 properties was not enough. The best oil prices in history were not enough. Uh, even forbidding you know, uh, imports from your citizens was not enough. Uh, skyrocketing the debt was not enough. So what they did, they, re they, they took a measure that you know, in Latin America we all know very, very well, which was starting the printing presses. We know what happens when you start you know, printing money like a maniac, inflation hit. What happened when inflation hit a couple of years ago that inflation started going very, very rapidly up? Instead of Nicolás Maduro immediately you know, uh, quitting his job and asking for forgiveness from the Venezuelan um, population, no. He said that there was, again, again you know, dark forces, there was an economic war being waged against Venezuela. And he did what literally an imbecile would do, which is establishing uh, price controls. There's a magnificent book, which I recommend you to read, published, uh, sorry, it's, it's uh, available online uh, at the, on the Mises Institute website, 40 Centuries of Wage and uh, Price Controls. It's a very good book, read it. If you want the summary, they have never worked, never. Never, never, ever. Ludwig von Mises highlighted that both in the times of Diocletian, the emperor in, in Roman times, and under the French revolutionary terror, capital punishment, I mean, they would kill you, was the, you know, was the penalty if you, if you do not comply the, the, the control prices. Not even with that price controls work. So, what they always, I mean, the achievement that they always get is you get scarcity and black markets. And that is exactly what happened in Venezuela. A few years ago, as you may remember, we had the toilet paper crisis, the very infamous toilet paper crisis, and now it's basically the supermarket crisis because supermarkets are empty, there's nothing there. There's nothing, but the prices are controlled. So. Chavez said to the New York Times um, that, you know, capitalism was not going to achieve the goals he, he wanted, and he invited all of us to uh, join him in the 21st century uh, socialism. So let's see, very quick, let me see, okay, no, I have some time. Let's see quickly some of the achievements. I, I'll go very quickly because I would like to have your questions also, and I've been talking for half an hour already. Okay, 
Yes. This is a, uh, this is probably even worse. I mean, it's very difficult to get uh, to get numbers. I like this this index. It's it's a new creation by Bloomberg. I think it has five years or so. The most miserable economies in the world. It's a combination of uh, unemployment and inflation. Venezuela has always been the first. That's you know a revolutionary achievement. Always the most miserable economy. Competitiveness, I mean, so to speak. This is Latin America. I mean, this, this is, you know, to put it in football terms, you know, things that are important in life. This is not the World Cup. This is third division, you know, Belgium, really. <laughs> and Guyana, Argentina, I mean, really, this is not like a high level competition. The, the only one that is behind Venezuela is Haiti, which is the poorest country in America and has, in many cases, sub Saharan you know, um, standards. Well, okay, inflation cannot get worse than this. Yes, it can. <laughs> this is how inflation looks like. This is some, some guy, I don't know, I found it in Univision. Some guy took, this is for instance, you want to buy toilet paper? That's how the, we were talking with Richard about this. <laughs> about this, you want to buy a chicken? You need, you know, like a little small cart, you know, to get the. This is how inflation looks like. Venezuela is one. Well, Caracas is the most uh, violent city in America. This is, you know, like the road of the former Bolivar. I'll show you how workers' liberation looked like. Two dollars minimum wage. That was last March. But okay, the government changed the currency. Things are always are, things are better. When they launch this, this is you know the new minimum wage. So you have we have to bear. I mean, I hate the minimum wage, and I would abolish. But we have to bear in mind that most of workers in Venezuela make minimum wage. So it's a very interesting metric. When they launched this last August the twentieth, they launched the new sovereign Bolivar. One one thousand eight hundred uh, Bolivars. That's the new one, and they announced it as a great, you know, thing, $30. At the current exchange rate, it's already 20 and declining. I mean, it, it, was, it lost a third of its, uh, of its uh, exchange rate with the dollar in, in a month. And it's going to get worse and worse. There's famine. I mean, literally, people are dying of hunger. This is, you know, people trying to buy things in, um, in supermarkets. At the beginning of 2006, 70% of Venezuelans claimed that they at least had three meals a day. By the end of 2006, only 34, 34 sorry, made that claim. This is a woman showing that's her only meal in the day. Children faint at school because they are not properly fed. This is how hospitals of you know, 21st socialism look like. This looks like really like a war zone hospital. And in a way, it is. It's a war of the state against its own citizens. This is magnificent. I mean, it's, it's, it reminds to Auschwitz, done, made in socialism. I mean, it, it, it would be funny if, it's not, if it weren't so sad. Some, you know, uh, innovation. <laughs> Incubators. Are, and this, and, and with, this, with this I'll stop. All these faces, all the people you see here, some of them, and, the, and this audience is extremely young, and that's very, it's, that's amazing. Some of them are even younger than, than, than some of you. All these people have ceased to exist. They have all been killed, and this is just a show, you know, there's, there's much more. These, these are some of the victims of last year's repression against students. So, just to conclude, Mises explained it very clearly. The alternative is, the only alternative is between social cooperation or this, the disintegration of society. In 1989, Poland abandoned socialism, and in less than 30 years, you know, Poland is the eighth economy in the European Union, and just a week ago, or less than a week ago, it had got the status of, of developed economy. Venezuela in 1999, in 19 years, adopted 21st century socialism, and today is a humanitarian tragedy. Thank you very much. <laughs>